Hello everyone and welcome to this session. It is sensory systems, designing and managing a sensory panel. Now, when you're coming to the uh, tasting of things, the uh, analysis, the sensory aspects of spirits, there's one man that you go to. That man is Matthew Pawley and he's joining us now. Hello to you, Matthew. Hello there, David. Nice of you to invite me along and, and thanks very much to the organizers uh, for making this happen. So uh, yes, so today we're going to be talking about sensory panels and um, really kind of the, the whys and hows and, and what's the points and all that sort of thing. So this is not going to be the most comprehensive uh, sort of PhD level uh, sensory panel um, description, but what we're going to do is give you an overview for sort of the man on the street, the distiller on the street, if, if you will, uh, as to how to start a basic sensory panel and, and kind of incorporate that into your best practice and really how you manage your, your distillery, but also your distilled spirits. So without much further ado, let's crack on. So just to give you an idea of why it is I'm sat in front of you today, uh, I'm assistant professor of distilling at Heriot Watt University. Uh, I'm also a PhD student part-time in the sensory aspects of gin. Uh, I'm a consultant to industry through Distillers Knows Limited and potential YouTuber, which uh, watch this space. Um, I'm a graduate of Heriot Watt University, uh, an Englishman in Scotland, and a home county's escapee. If you look there, I am not quite in London, but London adjacent. Um, so, um, what have I done? I've spent two summers in Speyside as a student. I was one of those annoying students that was constantly trying to get industry experience. I worked with Tate and Lyle in North Greenwich, um, worked with Bacardi Product Development as the master distiller for Oxley Gin. I worked as a distiller for Bombay Sapphire when they moved from uh, Greenalls to Laverstoke Mill, their current new Laverstoke Mill site, which I recommend you go and check out if you haven't seen. It's an absolutely stunning site. Anyway, enough with the life story, let's crack on with the rest of the, uh, the content. So what's the point? So your consumers will never be able to pick up on the subtle differences. Anyway, this is kind of like the operator grumble you get uh, when you try and start off uh, a sensory taste panel. Um, and really, you are the gatekeepers of your brand. So you are in charge of controlling subtle nuances and subtle nuances that you notice are the sort of the, the warning signs of potential of what's known as product drift. And what is product drift? So you as producing your brand, you are ensuring that your second bottle is fulfilling on the promises made by your first bottle. So your consumer has looked at your marketing, has seen all your fantastic materials and has bought your product and is now a fan, is now on board and has obviously gone to multiple platforms on social media to try and, and, and to hail this fantastic product and how, what a wonderful flavor it is and what wonderful cocktails it makes. So the problem is, but over time, if you're not very, very careful, if you're not on the lookout, you can potentially have what's known as flavor drift. And this is where that second bottle starts to drift away in the flavor performance from the first bottle. And really, it is your job to make sure you're fulfilling the promises made. It is literally your business to catch a problem before it goes out the door. I guess, um with uh, people that are uh, drinking different products, they might buy the first bottle, but they might not be getting the second or the third, but they might then buy like the seventh or something like that. So this drift that you're talking about, one little change between the two you might not notice, but then as that sort of builds up two, three, four, five, six, seven, that's when you're talking about with these these big changes, isn't it? So, so we're talking about like minor variations batch to batch, but you're correct that those minor variations can add to quite a lot of, you know, quite a big difference over time. And so, yes, it's very, very infrequently that you'll get a consumer, unless they're very dedicated consumers, who will buy, you know, the next batch of a particular product. And, you know, certain people may, especially if it's something like a seasonal drink that you buy over Christmas, it might be a Christmas to Christmas purchase. Um, you know, a nice Christmas treat. I'm sure you've all got drinks. You think, yeah, I'll get a bottle of that in for Christmas. Well, you know, you want it to taste the same from one Christmas to the next. And that's really where you need to be on the lookout for that, those minor differences. So really this needs to be part built in to the fabric of how you organize your, your practice and how you organize your distillery as part of best practice and what's known as due diligence. So that just means that you're keeping a lookout and really it should be part and parcel of the quality control that really helps you sleep at night. So to produce a clean and meaningful data set means that when you do your panels, you're actually 
being fair and asking the correct question um, and, and getting the correct answer out of the question you're asking. So each, when I say that, um, each time you sit your panelists down, you're asking them to spot a difference. And what you're asking them is a particular question between two different batches, if that makes sense. Mm. And really, it's all about asking the right question and then holding your panel in such a way that you get a meaningful answer. And that answer is expressed through data. And the data needs to be kept clean and meaningful. And we'll talk about how we maintain the, the, the status of your data to keep it meaningful in a moment. Right. Yeah, I'm going to ask you. Sorry, I'll cut this a little bit out because I'll ask you another. Is it this is a good time to ask you about like, is this a good time to have the more practical example that we talked about or? Do you want yeah, to OK, yeah, that's fine. So let me get the academic bit out of the way and then. Yeah. Um, yeah, so then where would we, we, can talk about it. we can talk about it at the end. That's fine. Just, I'll just let you know. What about it. your ideal panelist? Yeah. And then the ideal. So maybe, yeah, I don't know where we I don't, I don't think there is a, a spot to put in. Just um, crack on and ask. <laughs> let's, let's, let's just, um, let's just roll with it. It's fine. Okay. Let's go back to one of the things I wanted to just, what I'll mention here, but I won't do the full worked example is, um, because I guess like when pe some people start distilling, they're like, well, I'm following the same recipe. It's got to be the same every time. And I yeah. think, so I'm going to make that point now. Okay, so um, anyway, we're still recording. So I'll just keep going on. Um, uh, let me think of how I'm going to start that question now. Um, uh, so, okay, three, two, one. So I guess it's quite, um, when you're first starting to distill, it's easy to think, well, I'm following the same recipe, you know, whether that be I'm making whiskey or rum or gin or whatever, surely it should be the same. But I guess because you're using these natural resources, the seasonality, there's what is the temperature in your distillery, the ambient temperature between winter and summer. These are all things that can create these little variations. And that's the reason why you want to check against some sort of reference each time as you go through that you're largely on course with your uh, with the spirits that you're releasing. Well absolutely David you make an excellent point and um, as an academic we lecture to the students we have a chemical engineer come in uh, and we it's always important to get different perspectives and I like to have when teaching distilling have people from different perspectives come in so we'll have uh, a, a guy who's worked for 40 years in the whiskey industry and a chemical engineer in and really when the chemical engineers look at it they say well a difference in reflux isn't a massive amount of difference numerically but then what we've found is and we know through sort of empirical knowledge is that those small differences can make a massive difference to the final uh, sensory uh, delivery of, of the product so you know we, we know that the thresholds of these chemicals that the threshold being the point at which you can actually smell the thing and it becomes noticeable is actually really really small so uh, the being so small means that we're really sensitive to really minute and small changes and, and don't forget the sense of smell has been a, a way of surviving for, for millennia and so it's really important that we are able to have such a sensitive sense of smell hard to say um in order to pick out those minor differences because at one point in our evolution it was a matter of life and death so you're right whether the tiny minute differences that happen because of, of life because of the fact that you say a change in weather conditions a seasonality because of your you're buying in your botanicals because you know then when we come into sort of cask mature things like whiskey it's a whole other thing because that's another natural product containing different amounts of sugars and different volatile compositions so you're absolutely right so those tiny minute differences can have a massive impact on the, the sensory performance of your product. So it's it's really important so to kind of sweat the small stuff on this because it's that small stuff that we're picking up. Okie dokie. So in academic um, applications, so theories can be proven or disproven in academic trials, but we do that at a small scale because we can take bigger risks because obviously it takes quite a lot of persuasion to say to a distiller as a 12,000 litre distillation run, by the way, we would like to take, you know, 30 grand of your botanicals and um, however much of your grain neutral spirit and would you mind if we did something different that's quite a big uh, amount of big sale sales put uh, as big 
Sorry, can I do that again? Yeah, you can say that again. That's fine. Okay, thanks. Three, um, two, one. Yeah. So, in ac academics, and I'll oh, try again. <laughs> Sorry, that's fine. <laughs> Lost me flow, me creative flow state, David. Right, Three, let's go. Three, two, go. Okay, so in academia, we um, do sort of sensory tasting panels to try and prove and disprove various theories because at small scale we can take greater risks because it's quite a sales gig and amount of buy-in for a company to say does a really large like a 12,000 litre distillation to say do you mind if we take 30 grams of your botanicals and do something slightly different never mind the grain neutral spirit so in academia we do small scale trials and really we use the sensory taste panels as a way of proving or disproving the impact of whatever theory we're trying to prove or disprove. And really, when you combine this with analytical chemistry, that's when you're starting to get some, some really interesting results. And my research uh, as a PhD student is where we take uh, analytical chemistry and then comparing that to sort of sensory outcomes and, and seeing if you can build those relationships. And that starts to become more powerful. We're talking about real world impacts of various different things that we as analytical chemists are observing. Um, with a highly trained panel, tiny differences can be picked up on. So don't forget, there is nothing more sensitive than the human nose. So we talked about analytical chemistry, and often we can pick things up on the nose, smelling, the distiller's nose, if you will, um, more in, in more greater sensitivity that we couldn't even dream about picking up on. They're, they're at the detectable threshold of your nose, but below the detectable threshold of the analytical chemistry. So you can also combine those two things together, uh, and which is an awesome way of spending an afternoon, which is a thing known as gas chromatography organoleptics. And this is where you identify flavor chemicals by putting yourself at the end, you're plugging your nose into a machine. Like I say, it takes a bit of a while to get hold of because you're kind of being asked to sniff for an extended period of time. And, and eventually you are gonna have to breathe out. So that always can be somewhat problematic because you can't just constantly smell for 45 minutes nonstop. And you plug your nose into the machine and your, your nose is in at the end of the machine. You're picking out the molecules and you're taking down sensory notes on a timestamp basis. And it's really quite interesting. And it's at that point that you can identify your flavor active compounds and the characteristic flavors of those compounds. It's really quite interesting, but at the same time, slightly bizarre, like all the best things in life. So Imagine if we have three glasses in front of you and they are A, B and C and top tip, I highly recommend string based luggage tags or a Sharpie pen or other uh, pen that is indelible pen to put on the bottom of your, your glasses. So you can go A, B and C and then if it gets a heated debate and people are moving glasses around willy nilly, A is still A and B is still B and there's nothing worse than if you get someone along who's feeling very avuncular on your taste panel and they mix them around and all of a sudden it's like that game Spot the Lady where you've got to try and chase the ace or whatever it's called. So yeah, mark up your glasses or use string based luggage tags, top tip. Um, you're looking to assess the impact of differences in the spirit by playing spot the difference with the panelists. So you've got A, B and C in a triangle test and you're trying to say like, A is the different one. And a good, a well-run panel will have a different difference every time. So the first panelist may come and it may be A, the next panelist, the difference may be C, C, and also you swap the differences. So you may have two of one and one of the other, and then you swap it round so you have one of the other and two of the, the next sub. So, you know, each time you should be um, exposing the, the product to the same amount of noses each time. That's if in an ideal world, and I know that certain practicalities may get in the way. But what you're trying to do is ask your panelists to spot the difference amongst three or sometimes four samples. So, the trouble is you're relying on human perception. And human perception is very easily influenced. In a actual fact, there is a whole million pound industry dedicated to altering human perception of products known as marketing. And that's important. We need marketing. Without marketing, there is no business. There is no industry. No one has a job. So what we need to do is try and overcome the external influence that could potentially alter the human perception of the product. So consciously or unconsciously, we want to be good boys and girls. We want to pass the test. We want to be the best in class, even if we don't know it. So we are trying to look for a difference or based on something other maybe than just the smell of the sample. 
So what we need to do is we need to make sure we are controlling the samples that are being sent out so that that way the only difference is the difference that you're looking for, okay? So you're controlling the, the other variables and that the only variable, the only difference is the difference you are particularly looking for. The other thing is we've got to try and maintain a degree of sort of level headedness so that our judgment isn't being affected by potential other influences. So for instance, if the boss comes in and who owns the company and everything about it and you, you know, yes, you know, we don't want to cause trouble and you want to be promoted and you really would rather not make too many waves. So we've got to try and make sure that there isn't external psychological influences. You know, people I find people with a huge vested interest, stakeholders in the brand, can sometimes maybe be worse at picking out the differences because they don't want to find a difference because they would much rather it went out the door and off you go. So this is our thing. These are the things you need to worry about when you're thinking about putting together your panel. This is how you protect the purity and the meaning of your data. OK, and that's something we're going to be coming back to because without purity, there's no meaning and life is meaningless. But we don't want that. We know that there is meaning in life, I'm sure. So how do we protect the purity of our data? So each panelist must not smoke, vape, eat or drink at least an hour before they sit on the panel, mainly due to odour carryover on clothes, as well as kind of tainting your palate. So here in Britain, we are fairly famous for curries. And I have to say, curries are possibly one of the worst meals to have before a taste panel because there's such a full level of intensity, lots of garlic, lots of onions, delightful and delicious as they may be, you really probably shouldn't have a curry at least an hour before your taste panel or indeed any other food or drink in case of. So also um, you need to prepare your samples in the same way. Each sample needs to be the same to try and as I say before, eliminate the differences, control your variables. The samples need to be at the same temperature because temperature affects the ability of the molecules to kind of form in the top of the glass. So what we're doing, our noses are looking for molecules. What we're doing is we're trying to saturate the headspace. That's the space between the liquid and the top of the glass. And we're trying to stick our noses in and sample those molecules. So if the temperature is different, then you have a different number of molecules or different profile of molecules even in the top of the headspace. Each needs to be at the same strength. We're comparing apples with apples. We could have, everything has to be the same strength, so there's no point having one at a stronger ABV than the other. We put a watch glass, okay? This is a watch glass, and you can get them from scientific equipment suppliers. And this is a cunningly branded ICBD branded tasting glass. And this is an ISO 9000 tasting, tasting glass that we are, which means that if you're tasting something in Australia, you can use the same glass in Hong Kong, in Scotland, in Edinburgh, in Putney, it doesn't matter. You're using the same glass for the same job in different locations. Again, controlling the variables, controlling the differences. You shouldn't let the sample sit for longer than 15 minutes, ideally, because again, those molecules start to dissipate. We lose the molecules and therefore you're losing that, the, thing you're, the very thing you're looking for. And as a distiller, the very thing you spend a lot of time and effort and inclination putting in to your product. The more panelists, the better, okay? So in statistics, the more numbers, the more powerful the data. So it's important that you have as many taste panels members as you can possibly master. Okay. So protect the precious. By that, I mean the data. Remember, your panelists, if your panelists manage to cheat, this, this renders the data tainted, biased, and meaningless. You need, as the panelist manager, to protect the meaning of the data you're generating. So what is the ideal panelist? So the ideal panelist is not surrounded by the smells of production all day. So the person who stood still side all day with all those smells going up their nose all the time, they can become what's known as no blind, nose blind. This is known as supernormalization. This is where you, it's another survival technique because if you were having to think about the things you were smelling that you smell every day, 
One, life would be exhausting. You'd be distracted all the time. So what you're looking for is new smells and new differences. So therefore, we is, our brain is very clever at screening out smells that we experience every day. So the person who's surrounded by the smell of your product every day may not be the best panel member. As we said before, you must be relatively uninvested in the result. I know that we're all very passionate about our products. And that's what makes the industry and, and our students so, so interesting and to do business with and to teach because we're all massively passionate. But in this instance, you've got to try and come with a certain amount of game face where you, you look at it dispassionately and make a judgment call based on purely the sensory performance of those samples. Preferably young noses. It should be preferably a young taste panelist. Obviously not too young within, you know, common decency and honesty and ethical dilemmas. They're not too young, but it has been proven by science that older noses get tired. And I'm sure some of the people who are watching this may be able to sympathize with that kind of feeling and notion. And there has been peer-reviewed actual science, I'm sorry chaps, that um, actually female noses are more sensitive to the subtlety and nuances of uh, of sensory analysis. Um, some, of, some of the females may actually be quite uh, uh, concurrent that sometimes men aren't particularly good at picking up on subtleties and nuances without making too many broad-based gender statements. Um, you shouldn't come wearing strong scents, perfume or aftershave. I have verbally, but not physically, ejected people from my sensory panel for, um, for coming and smelling far too fabulous by half. So it's important that you come smelling vaguely neutral. Um, so yes, now is not the time to splash it all over or whatever. There was a, a, um, a catchphrase back in the day. So I think it was brute, wasn't it? Anyway, I digress. Anyway, so the ideal taste panelist should come with an open, open mind, an open nose, and preferably be not too smelly. So the ideal sample size would be roughly 30 mils in an, an ISO 9000 tasting glass. 20% ABV by volume, you can sometimes taste things at 40%, but please be aware that the alcohol at 40% could burn your nose. Don't forget the um, olfactory bulb within the nose are the only exposed brain cells exposed to the atmosphere, okay? So they're very, very sensitive, okay? If they aren't the only exposed brain cells exposed to the atmosphere, you must go to a doctor immediately. But you also need to make that very <laughs> make sure that make myself laugh. There, sorry, um, <laughs> it's been a long day. Um, you also need to make sure that you treat those brain cells really carefully, okay? Because they're very, very sensitive. You don't go blasting them with forty percent ABV without care and you know attention to detail. You also must evaluate smell before taste. So therefore, the fact that when you're tasting things, you're forcing molecules up to the back of your nose, okay? This is known as it's important to evaluate smell before taste because this is because when we're taking a sample into our mouth and we're making slurpy noises because we're not at tea with our grandmother and we're slurping away, what we're trying to do is force the molecules up the back of the nose as this is known as retronasal smelling. And this can influence your um, cognition and, and the way that you notice smelling. So therefore, what we do is we do orthonasal smelling, which is through the front, and then we do into the mouth and we do retronasal smelling. But it's important that the retronasal smelling isn't influencing the orthonasal smelling. So what you do is you smell first and then you taste. OK. Yeah. Great. Um, I had a question about the alcoholic strengths. So if you've got it at 20 or 40 percent, how um, quickly do you need to proof down your um, sample beforehand? I mean, do you need to leave it for a bit? If it's, let's say it was at 40% anyway, but you wanted it at 20%, do you just add the 50-50 mix of water and then it's ready to taste straight away? Or do you want to leave it for a bit? I know there's a little bit of heat will be released from that proofing. So any thoughts on that? So really, you're trying to saturate the headspace. You're trying to fill that space between the liquid in the glass and the, and the top and, and your watch glass. So I would say I would give it at least five minutes to kind of let that kind of build up. So you've actually got something to smell, because if you, as you say, pounce on it too quickly in, in all eagerness and, and passion um, to, to really get involved, you can sometimes not really allow that headspace to fully saturate. So, yeah, I would give it five minutes and, and, a, bit, and a bit of a mix. I, I tend to give it a bit of a swirl and then sort of let it sit for five minutes and let it kind of chill out and let that headspace saturate nicely. Good sensory takes time. 
Yeah. What is the ideal sensory room? Well, ideally, and we are talking in ideal terms, I know that sometimes not all of these are applicable or even indeed, indeed possible. The ideal sensory room is free of odors, light and airy, clean and uncluttered. And the, if you're doing multiple panels occurring simultaneously, um, booths might be a nice idea to construct some form of booth formation um, in order to try and stop the influence of the person next to you and if you're all trying to copy the boss or the person you think got the better nose. Spittoons to allow you to spit out a sample between so you can taste and then not necessarily swallow. Because again, you know, if you're swallowing the sample and it goes down, not to wishing to be a killjoy, by the way, uh, and it's going into your belly and then you might be a, might be a little bilious. I know it happens, it's not to be crude. Uh, and then maybe you you burp and then some of those molecules come back up. And that's important that you, uh, you maybe don't influence you that way. So spittoons and glasses of water. So I have a, a glass here full of water, which is it's not gin and it certainly isn't beer, um, to kind of, you know, cleanse the palate and, and, uh, and whatnot. I would also say that it's a good idea to have lots and lots and lots, and I mean more than you, put, you would think you're going to need, of clean glassware. Because there's one thing sensory tasting panels use is glassware, and they use them at a, quite an alarming rate. It doesn't, if you've got four samples, you know, it doesn't take much before you have a significant amount of glassware on your hands. And as someone who used to run a tasting company before you could rent ISO 9000 tasting glasses, I know that all too well. I have a flat in Edinburgh full of ISO 9000 tasting glasses. And I even now I rent them because they arrive clean and they go away dirty. But always get more than you need, okay? Have more glassware than you need. And then that way you're not tempted to cut corners by I'll give it a little bit of a rinse. I'll give it a rinse under the tap and a dry on the tea towel and away we go, we'll be fine. And, and that's a nightmare, exactly. It, it, it brings me out in the horrors uh, because all of a sudden there's all kinds of variables and potential crossover and what's on the tea towel and all other sorts of various different questions that need to be asked. Um, so yeah, have more than you need and have some left over, that's fine. You can all chill out at the end of the taste panel and taste the nicest, your favorite gin out of the ones that are left over. That's, that's, and that's a money well spent is having an abundance, um, uh, abundance of riches in clean glassware. Okay, the great exception in the room, it's been a while and I haven't mentioned COVID-19. So as is the, uh, the way of things, it's now time to talk about the, the global pandemic and its influence and impact. So um, many more ta remote tastings are going on. That's good. That means that we have people around the world who can partake in your taste panel, potentially. Um, this still requires some training because it's important that we get meaningful data. Um, your panelists need to be aware of their surroundings. Don't forget, you are more used to the smell of your house than anybody else. So do it in familiar surroundings with familiar smells. That way, that the only difference is the smell in your glass and the, the saturation of your headspace. And one of the unintended consequences is people are much, much less inclined to share a glass with another person. So, you know, to having just come through uh, a upper respiratory tract infection uh, pandemic, we are somewhat less inclined to share a glass that someone else has had their upper respiratory tract on. So um, people need clean glasses back to having more, more clean glasses than they know what to do with um, another kind of words to the wise there. What is significance? What is the what what are the odds? So a difference is only a difference. It is detected by a larger number of people than if simply by guessing. So if I have a three glasses in front of me, I have a one in three chance of just coming in and being like the lazy operator and going, oh it's that one. Leave me alone. Um, and if you do that, you've got a one in three chance of getting it. So a difference is if your result shows that you've got a greater detection rate than one in three. Training your ninja noses. Um, how do you train your ninja nose? Um, we've got things known, such as smelling kits, and these are commercially available from commercial companies. And this allows you to, to practice on particular purified or particularly kind of industry standard smells. So you can pick out different kits for different characteristics and they give you those compounds. And getting those compounds in the purest form is really expensive. So especially analytical grades, those are to get it pure so that it's, uh, we have get meaningful results from the analytical. It's really, really expensive because they have to be so incredibly pure. 
Practice makes perfect. So what I mean um, is by the better you are, the more you smell, the better you become at smelling. And this is known as neural plasticity. And this is where your brain becomes better at doing something, having done it repeatedly. And I, in the past, have had students and sent them on a nasal safari. So we're based in Edinburgh. So I send them down a particular street, maybe I know the likes of Prince's Street in Edinburgh. And I say, right, walk the length of Prince's Street. And I want you to notice all of the smells you smell as you walk along Prince's Street. And you might be able to get, you know, from one end, the smell of North British distillery, because that's at the west end of, of Edinburgh. Uh, you, and then as you walk down, you might walk past the a coffee shop, you might walk past uh, a guy selling burgers in a, in a, from a van, you might walk past now with the advent of vaping, you can get some really quite intense nasal experiences as you walk down the street, it's like, it's like someone forcing a strawberry up your nose. Um, so, you know, become better at noticing what your, your kind of nasal or ag organoleptic landscape is, if you will and then start kind of attributing those smells to various different characteristics and sort of build up an eloquence and vocabulary around what you're smelling and just generally practice really become more mindful and living in the present moment with what you're actually smelling. Data, data, potato, potato. So um, we have lots of numbers, but now we need meaning. So I'm afraid to say, David, it's time to bring on the stats. Um, so what we're, gonna, we're looking to try and calculate is what's known as a p-value. And the p-value is the, the value the, that dictates the number of people who picked the difference. Okay, this sounds hugely worrying and hugely scary, but there are statistics tables to make this easy. And I'm not going to pronounce the ISO, no, no, uh, ISO number, you can look at that on the slide. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to um, Look at the null hypothesis, which is if everyone just picked it out by guessing, if we had a lazy operator who really didn't care and just wanted to get on with his tea break and chose you know, any old one, we're trying to disprove and reject the null hypothesis. And if we are getting a P number, that means it is greater than chance, you can reject the null hypothesis and everything has meaning. So it's very, very exciting if you can get a, a good P number. As um, a scientist, once the stat starts to work, things get really quite interesting. Well, thanks very much for that, Matthew. It's given us a really good overview um, and an introduction, because I think, uh, well, I, certainly I've learned something from it, and I'm sure a lot of people watching might not have really thought about this. They might have thought that this is really something that these big distilleries do, but uh, maybe not so much for myself. So in that sort of vein, um, it would be quite nice to kind of have a bit of a discussion about how on a smaller scale this could be applicable. So I think we talked about, you know, each time you were doing a distillation batch or something like that, you might want to do this, you know, the triangle test or something, uh, this sensory panel. Um, and that would be against, I believe, a, a reference sample. Is that the right terminology that you'd use? So, yeah, you've got to, um, so to, to make sure you're fulfilling on the promise of your first bottle, uh, when it comes to your second, you, you use your reference sample. And really, as an organization, you agree, you have to agree that this is going to be the reference sample and, and keep that as your, your guideline. And, and what I would say is sort of keep a number of bottles of your reference sample, wrap them in foil, possibly with seller tape or some form of other tape, other tapes are available, um, and then put them in, in the, your freezer uh, and that will hopefully keep them dark and cold and, and stop them from, from moving. Because obviously, if you've got to, have a reference that has to be relatively stable so that um, you're not constantly drift, everything isn't constantly drifting. Hmm. And is this with the, the sensory, is it something that can only, that can be done just with the nose or is both aspects of it important? Because I guess I know sometimes I've seen people use, they might use the nose from a sample like that and then what they've not used, they're, well, because they've not even tasted it, they've put that back in the in their reference bottle. I mean, is that something that you can do to keep that reference bottle going? Or, I mean, how do you refresh it? The, the scientist in me kind of, yeah, sees that and, and has a mild, <laughs> mild triggering <laughs> anxiety. Okay, I'm, I'm wearing the white coat for a reason. This is not just a long, a shorthand of being clever, David. Um, <laughs> 
So, so I would suggest, because what you've done is you've had this in the glass and it sat around and we've all had a lovely chat about it and it sat and then someone left the lid off and then, you know, someone else got distracted by their phone because the phone went and it sat there for some time. And then, David, you, you want to pour it back into the bottle? <laughs> I know people that have done it. So well, I, I mean, none of the, the people I like and respect is it, David. So... Um, <laughs> No, I would, t I would, in all seriousness, suggest maybe discarding that sample that's been sat in the glass in the sunshine in a warm room with a lid off whilst we all have a good talk and, you know, someone with perfume walks past and whatever, and then um, start from scratch for the next time. So, you know, no, no double dipping. No. But when you're happy with that, your, your more freshly produced uh, batch of spirit is in line with the reference sample, then of course you can use that as a future reference sample, right? That's the that's the concept behind it. Potentially, yes. Yeah. So you've got to then, because um, there will come an end. So even if you've got sort of three bottles kept by, there'll come a point where you run out of that reference. And and yes, it's important to think of a sort of succession. Think, well, you know, we were particularly happy with this blend, or we were particularly happy with this this batch before bottling, uh, and keep some bottles of that to one side with a view to to having the next reference sample. So yeah, that's something to bear in mind. And so on that basis of a kind of, you know batch to batch kind of um, quality check, as it were. Um, at what point in the distillation would you, um, and let, let, you know, let's say if it's like whiskey or gin or something, at what point in the distillation do you want to do those checks? Is it straight off the still? Is it once you've proofed it, once you've bottled it? Where would you do it? So I'm, I'm fairly sure the majority of the viewers at home it would check most of the things they make as a kind of a basic quality sort of you know distillation by distillation basis. But really, that the real flash points uh, are where you've taken something and blended them together. So then you take that blend and then you assess it. And also, if you have put it put the product through a series of processes, uh, and really the, the next kind of pinch point that becomes important is sort of immediately before you start bottling. So, so having you know, run it, through, you know, you having blended it, you've done a triangle test. You're happy with the blend. You run it through because it will run through a filter, run through a filling machine, potentially a vacuum filler, and then run, you know, it gone into the bottle. Then really, you should be, be tasting it to make sure that the the impacts of all of those processes has not altered adversely altered the sensory performance of that product. Mm. So then, would you theoretically need to have a reference sample? like post blend and then a separate reference sample post bottling to do those to try so and... i no, i don't think ideally um you know if your bottling procedure is impacting to, to that degree of significance you need to revisit your bottling procedure okay the filtration you know we all put our, our product through filter to make sure that there isn't anything you know that could have potentially end up in the final product but the filtration process shouldn't be impacting that much to the final to the final actual product as it goes down the line but that's a good question david yeah. so it could be the same reference sample that's yeah. and i think um one of the other um things to particularly be aware of in addition just to the guess the day to day is any time when you might be making a big change to how your production works so that might be that you uh, you've upscaled your recipe to a larger still or you've introduced a second still but it's basically the same but it's another still or you've changed your water source or your filtrate any big change in the products that's another time to really be extra keen and focus to check that you're getting that continuity that consistency in the flavor is that reasonable so as i always say in distilling if you change one thing you change three things because there is so much going on within uh, a distilled beverage there's an awful lot of engineering um, going into sort of the chemistry and all of that going inside the bottle that we, we still fully don't entirely know all that's going on and uh, so you have to be very very careful when you're changing things that you don't change things uh, away from the, the, the actual reference sample so yes you're absolutely right anything you do anything you change uh, can and potentially will have an impact on your finished product and needs to be considered and, and really scrutinized and, and drilled down on in this fashion. Mm. Moving to actually picking the panel, choosing the panel. Um, I mean, if you, weren't, if you weren't producing, as you might not be if you're starting on quite small, if you're not producing every day, would you suggest it's better to do the analysis if you're doing it in a distillery, say, on a day that you hadn't been producing because there wouldn't be so many aromas and things around? 
Well, that's it. You've got to try and find a, a relatively, uh, what they call it, a Roma neutral or a Roma, f a Roma free environment so that you aren't, yeah. It, sometimes the, the still house is possibly the, the worst possible place Some you place, could do it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, somewhere else, maybe. Yeah. Somewhere quiet, yeah. Um, Literally anywhere else, in fact, in the still house. <laughs> With one or two exceptions. So. Maybe not like the perfume counter at a department store would be a joke. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so then in terms of like the number of people, I understand this idea that more people you have, the the more meaningful the data will be. But there's obviously a practical implication to that. So if I was doing a smaller group of, say, five, six people to do, is it better to have an odd number or an even number? If I'm if I've only got a limited resource to find people that have got to be reliable and meet the various criteria that you discussed, what's the minimum I can get away with? So yeah, the statistic the statisticians, which is a hard word to say, um have a word that's known as power. So the power of your your data. And the more numbers, the more number of people you have. Um, the more powerful and meaningful the data can be, because, you know, we all have our off days, uh, even consciously or, or subconsciously, or, you know, um, someone could have an upper respiratory tract infection that affects their sense of smell, imagine. Um, so, um, you know, it's important that you have, I would say, a minimum of around five people. It's often good to have an odd number, because if, if we have a sort of split or close call uh, on the vote, then it's quite good to be able to be like, well, three people have said it's five. Uh, or, you know, three people have a massive issue. We all need to stop and rethink our lives and how do, what do we do? You know, it's, it, 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 yeah, you need, it's best, sometimes best to have an odd number just so that we, the arithmetically you can't get a tie because then it becomes down to a battle of wills and who can shout the loudest, which is never fun. Well, who's the boss? <laughs> <laughs> I own everything and I think it's fine. Send it out. <laughs> if in doubt, send it out. That is not the attitude. It, so, uh, on the assumption that let's just say for ease that it was a unanimous panel and they all decided um no there is definitely a difference here and so your sample that you've just this batch of distillate that you've created is different to the reference sample and it's unanimous then what yeah that that's when um that's when some really quite important conversations have to happen and everyone needs to keep a level head and, and be thinking with their analytical brain and be like, right, what's, what's the workaround? Um, you know, if, is it a significant difference or is it a difference that you, you can notice and that you can then mitigate? You know, if it's really, if it's significant and is it, if it's like a, a, a fault that stand out and be like, right, this, this is a real, you know, I can spot this a mile off, then you're in trouble. You're in real trouble because really, you, you, if it's that obvious, you shouldn't really be blending it across. But then if it's a, if it's a minor difference, if it's a subtle difference, then you're into sort of blending territory where you have to work around uh, a percentage addition. And then you have to do another panel saying, right, with a test sample, it's like, right, this is you know, an addition of X percent. And at which point can you pick it up? You know, and this is sort of when it comes to new product development and, and scale up, you know, you might start off, you, you have a, a minor difference. And then what you would do is slowly but surely increase the addition rate bit by bit. And then you you'd then be looking to see if you're getting complaints back from the customers. But, you know, and really, you, you shouldn't be getting complaints by, back from the customers because at that point it's too late. And they've gone onto multiple platforms and Instagram's on fire and Twitter wants to, you know, send you out to the bad place. Um, One no. star review. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, so it's, it's, it's kind of, you then go, right, what can we do? Is there a workaround? You know, serious conversations and, and sort of put the integrity of your brand at the forefront before all else, really. Hmm. And then we, uh, I mean, I guess that we are talking about, like, what level is it noticeable and stuff? And I guess, like, that's a slightly different, because you're looking for something different to what you might be looking at in these triangle tests and that and i guess that's i think as we discussed before we we started recording the difference between a sensory panel and a focus group and i guess that might be moving a bit more towards that but i would i be right in thinking that there's a there's a number of um disciplines or the disciplines that you get from a good sensory panel can be brought over to having a good focus group in terms of for new product development or that sort of thing 
So a focus group, to my mind, is more along the lines of um, sort of market research. And, and, you know, there are companies out there that will do, that will specialise in going into, like, in the field, and sort of we call it in, in vivo, uh, where you go and you look at the people in, in a bar and say, look, how do you, um, what do you think to this? Is there a difference? Uh, and, but there's also, you know, the, the elements of best practice that we've discussed in the triangle test can also be applied there because, again, you want it to be a meaningful data set. So, you know, it's got to be the same volume of stuff in the sample. It's got to be the same, same ABV if that's you know, not what you're looking for. So, yeah, the, the elements of best practice and, and sort of, you know, uh, discipline and, and good behaviour, basically, and common sense are, are, are still to be, to be brought. Mm. And would you also say that, because um, it's got to be blind, so in addition to the five people that you had, or more, for your test, you need someone else that was doing the pouring, right? Someone else would need to be doing that, ideally. So, yeah, you have someone who's like the, the panel manager, and they are the one, the sort of the nose that knows, if you will, uh, and they, um, they are the one pouring out the samples, because obviously, or if you are the one who normally lays out the samples, you get... So, you know, someone else to you go out the room and then another member of the panel does do one specially for you where you don't know the difference. So that way you can still have you've not lost a panel member because uh, someone's being the panel. Yeah, that's helpful. Yeah, I think I was thinking about what you're saying about people wanting to cheat. And I can just so imagine that. I mean, the things where you've done tastings, people have constantly tried to work out the difference. Oh, has this one got like slightly more legs up the glass? No, it's just because how it's been poured. And so I think like. <laughs> Like as identical as it can be, like the levels, everything. I think if it, if you're splashing it on the side a bit, maybe you need to change the glass because you're right. People will just their mind will go it'll be feverish to try yes. and where's the hidden clue? This one's slightly Every, further forward than the other ones. Everyone wants to be good at this. You know, this is a, a one people want to pick out the difference, and it's a real struggle to kind of fight the the kind of inner what would you call it, like the class nerds, like, I, me, 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 me. It's like, come on now, you know, <laughs> just... You know, got one in three chance anyway. <laughs> there's a, there's a, not bad odds. <laughs> Go for a punt. No, uh, well, we are all, essentially, that the trouble is we're all punting on, on people picking out or not picking out the difference. So it's important that, you know, it's a fair, it's a fair test. Good. Excellent. Well, um, Thank you very much for giving us so much of your time and your expertise. I think it's been absolutely uh, fascinating and we shall hopefully speak to you again soon. And thank you everyone for watching. Thank you for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure, which I'm sure might have come across. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent.